this morning was a little different. I woke up to a text from our guy, Kyle. Our group chat was mm. popping, and yeah. Kyle was like, he said something. But it was blurry, and I was still kind of half asleep. And bam, you get hit with this freaking news. What was going – Scott Boris doesn't sleep? No, what's that about? He's up negotiating. Are you kidding me? Carlos Correa to the Mets, 300 M's, Giants, see you later. You made a good effort. I mean, is there a bigger what is you doing, baby, than the San Francisco Giants offseason right now? I mean, I feel for this fan base. I think like I want to start saying I am sorry to San Francisco Giants fans. You had John Heyman giving you yeah. false information. And then you had Carlos Correa on your team. We did an episode, Jake. Yeah. We said the rivalry between the Dodgers mm. and the Giants is going to be off the charts. Carlos Correa is the perfect villain in San Francisco. He looks good in orange. You're damn right he looks good in orange, but it ain't going to be the orange and black. Oh, my gosh. He's a Met. And you know what? Credit Uncle Stevie. <laughs> he smelled blood in the water, and the dude's a shark. He went after it. My goodness. I mean, in, in the past 24 hours, basically, we, we got a tweet that was like, there's no timetable for Correa's presser. Uh, there's some questions about his physical, which that's still the greatest unknown of all of this, which is uh, Correa from the start, his free agency last year. We, we've heard rumors about his back. People are saying it's not his back, but we still know nothing about the physical. Um, and our, our guy, we, we should give Brother Jeff credit. He's got an article with a lot of the big questions, if, if you're wondering kind of how this all went down, because they did agree to terms, and what does that mean? And can you still negotiate with other teams if you agree to terms? And basically it's, you know, until, until pen hits paper, kind of like uh, how real life kind of works, um, you're not. And Carlos Correa, although it was announced that he would be a San Francisco giant, he's going – to Uncle Steve Cohen's Mets. And I, I think we circle up on the Giants, Trev, because uh, I think that's... We could talk about what's next for them, because you're right, we did do a full episode about, yeah, it's, no, I like the fit and offense and defense, and Crawford slides to third, right? Um, we'll see what their plan is. The New York Mets, Carlos Correa, who I has an argument that he was the best shortstop available of this amazing shortstop crop. Both sides of the ball, platinum glove. Uh, the hitting stats are better than I'd remembered if you go and check out his baseball reference. The dude's put together a couple big boy seasons. The youngest of the shortstops, 28. But maybe he's not a shortstop anymore, <laughs> Trev. I think he's the Mets third baseman next to his uh, PR teammate, yes. Frankie Lindor. That's nuts, man. A you know, you know, I love Cuban ball players. I also love Puerto Rican ball yeah. players. Get you Eddie Rosario on this team, uh. stat, please. Okay, listen, I do want to touch on like the agent and negotiating thing because typically what happens is, you know, yeah, you're negotiating with the team, and even when you actually come to terms with the team, you really want to keep it a secret so you can go tell the other teams that you were talking to. Look, we're out. We're going to sign this because the agents do want to have a good relationship with these front offices. They represent a lot of players. They want to be right. able to talk to these people and like be respected. But once your, the team side comes out and says, ah, the physical is not exactly where we want it. It opens up the floodgate. You can go talk to other teams. If you think that contract that you agreed to in terms is in jeopardy, which it is, which it was. Um, I don't think it's the least bit shady or you know a, a bad business practice to go back out and see what you got there and that's what happened and uh like jeff said in his article you know the mets did make that last uh, attempt at correa and that's proved to be the difference and now he's a he's a met man it's just uh what a, what a fucking what a world we're living in right now uncle stevie the payroll is going to be close to 500 m's with the luxury tax and guess what he doesn't care. He doesn't give a shit. It's nothing. Uh, you know, beers might go up a dollar at, at City this year, up in uh, Trev's Queen, Flushing, New York. Flushing, yeah. Um, that's something to track. I'd like to track that. I, I want to. I want to do the best. 
I want to do the fun baseball stuff with the Mets. I want that to loop in to, because I tr- talked about it a little bit on Wake and Jake, Trev, but the effect of an owner and what Steve is doing and what this is going to do to the other owners, because holy smokes. But first, Mets baseball. Nimmo, was he going to leave? Nope. He's back. He got re-upped. He'll be hitting leadoff for you. Correa Lindor, your left side of Team Puerto Rico, your left side of the Mets, two $300 million players. Uh, one of the slickest switch hitting shortstops, uh, one of the slickest <laughs> righty shortstops with one of the most powerful arms we've ever seen in Major League Baseball. He'll be going to third base. Pete Alonso, again, check out that baseball reference. Big boy numbers only. Jeff McNeil squirreling it around. Starling Marte, who they brought in last year. We're going to have Mark Canna, who they brought in last year. They just brought in Omar Narvaez. We mentioned it barely because it was like, oh, and a catcher for $7.5 million? That'd be some team's biggest free agent this year. Vogelback listed as DH. Darren Ruff is still there. Is that your DH platoon? Eddie oh. Escobar is a floater. Guillaume is a floater. They got big prospects. Brett Beatty. They've got Francisco Alvarez. Your pitching staff, Verlander, Scherzer, Sanga, Carrasco, Quintana. Trev, this whole free agency started, the first move of free agency, they gave Edwin Diaz a closer 100 mil. L- looking at this lineup, okay, now, and Francisco Alvarez kind of is a wild card to me too because this dude is an offensive-minded catcher. Uh, I think he play, I think he can throw the shit out of the ball too, um, but – the reports that you typically hear about him are massive pop um, from the backstop. And if you like, I know we have Omar Nevias here, but if you kind of add that bat in there as well, we're talking this, the lineup is like nine deep. Like Mark, right now, Fangrass has Mark Canna hitting eighth for you. Mark Canna is a really good big league hitter, dude. Yeah. And to think about the, there's so many things right here. Let me just go over this. Okay. There's balance in the lineup. Left-handers, there's right-handers. Your your bench pieces, like having Eddie Escobar on your bench and, and the fact that he can play kind of a bunch of different positions and he's a switch hitter and can give you good at-bats from both sides, like their lineup and their defense is set. You talked about the starting rotation, that set, the bullpen. David Robertson, to me, I, I sing this guy's praises all the time. Like he, He's going to be like kind of like a, a middle, high-leverage guy for them, maybe, like sixth-inning type guy. You talked about Edwin Diaz. It's like it's like it's like the porridge, bro. Mm. This team, not too young. Not a lot of rookies on this team. Maybe splash in one behind the plate, maybe. Not too old either. Yeah, you got Verlander. This team is just right. All sitting right 29, 30, 31, like experience. You got Buck Showalter at the hem helm. You got an owner that's clearly not afraid to spend any money. The franchise right now. You can't be in a better place than the New York Mets right now. You just can't. They've got those two top 50, top 50 prospects who are MLB ready, and I think that's important because, you know, we, you can go around the, the league and, you know, you see a guy who's, who's ranked 21st top prospect but expected MLB time is 2025. You know, that's uh, we'll see you when we see you. Uh, I wonder if the Mets are going to try to trade those guys in and upgrade somewhere else. Do you keep those guys around as the youth so when injuries and stuff do happen, they'll get their chance, uh, and then you might have just stumbled into another young piece for your team. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it's it's become like an internet joke, and I it does crack me up when you do something boring and you say life is a movie. For Mets fans, life's a movie right now. We We just got the richest owner. He's blowing through the own tax that got made up, like, in his honor. This is unreal. The New York Mets, like, for the last 30 years of, like, TV and cinema, if you made, like, a punchy Mets joke, everyone got it. It's over. Are are Uncle Stevie and is it Siler who owns the Padres? I think so. Are they just, like, boys being like, hey, let's, let's fuck the system up? Because both these teams... Padres and the Mets, if you go back, I don't know, three or four years, like they're middling, right? We had a shirt out, Metsy is a getsy. Padres are like kind of this team that no one really talks about because they play on the West Coast and they're not the Dodgers. 
both these teams have just went out and said, fuck it, dude. Like there's, Oh, there's good players available. Oh, we'll take them. Yeah. And they've, tur- they really have like put the other owners on notice. If you, Oh, you want a free agent? So do we. And now you better pay up. And they, I mean, they've been setting the market and setting the market. I'm very curious to see where this goes because we've, we've never seen spending like this before in baseball. We just haven't not at this level. Uh, not concentrated around, you know, uh, one owner with these new taxes and everything. I mean, this is, it's unprecedented what's happening right now. And you're right, man. If you're a Mets fan, holy shit. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some Braves fans or guy, Peter Moylan I had a couple tweets this morning, a little on edge. I mean, I, you know, you were in the middle of, we were talking like Braves potential dynasty, right? And now the, your toughest matchup might be in your division, um, and by the way, you lost your first baseman and shortstop that got you uh, that ring. Uh, I mean, Braves fans don't really care because they'll still be the Mets and, until they're not to the Braves. But your your division is stacked. The Phillies, who just went to the World Series, they signed Trey Turner and Ty Walker, which we haven't really talked about. The Nats went full rebuild. But by the way, like they're a team that can build up that payroll, and we've seen it. I mean, you know, the the Nats when they paid for Strasburg and Scherzer. You know, they were paying dudes. Um, someone mentioned the, the Marlins in my comments this morning. And they were like, man, that sucks. And I was like, you know what? It does and it doesn't. Because we're talking Miami. Trev, the moment the WBC got mentioned there, I got texts from you and Joe's McFly saying, we're going. Miami's an awesome city. Miami bumps. Miami slaps. There's money in Miami. The San Diego Padres, if they can go and ball out and bring in the dudes they've brought in the past few years, Miami Marlins, it comes down to ownership, man. And I I wonder the ripple effects this has across the league because the Miami Marlins right now cannot compete in the National League East. Straight up. People like rare things, okay? Especially um, people that have billions of dollars they like rare things they like having things that other people can't have you know what's rare an mlb franchise there are, there's only 30 of them in the world okay and if you have a chance to own a franchise in a big city and like leave your mark that's what these guys are looking for and i think there's going to be some billionaires that aren't in the game right now they're looking at steve and be like you are, you've made yourself like, I'm sure he was popular in, in New York circles just because of the amount of money he had and what he can do in the power, whatever. He never could have dreamed how popular he is in New York right now. And that's something that typically money can't buy. But if you buy a <laughs> baseball team and you do what he's doing, it can buy that. I think the social aspect of this is going to come into play. We're going to see some people off the off the field looking to buy into MLB because it's just rare. Yeah. I think this is going to change sports ownership, the way this has gone down. I... I... I want to give credit to Bill Simmons. He's obviously like a legend in, in the sports game. He got me once because he, he opened my eyes up to that, that the Golden State Warriors, you know, with everything they've done, and obviously, you know, Steph Curry, they didn't fully know. They kind of stumbled into something there. But they've turned into the Golden State Warriors. They got an arena in San Francisco. This is also a time in San Francisco where that place has boomed, and we'll get to the Giants in a second. But Silicon Valley and like every everything that's happened in the Bay Area over the past couple of years. But guess what? The Warriors owner, he owns the Golden State Warriors. And he gets mm. to tell all those tech nerds, like, hey, that's cool. I own the Warriors. And man, you're absolutely right. And I hope sports start going that way. Because there's too many teams, and you can name them, and I, I won't, but too many teams that view it as a business and an asset but not as a competitive, fun thing. Steve Cohen wants to go out and win and be kind of famous and be the big dog at the table, and let's roll it out there. There's a few MLB franchises and other franchises, too, that, you know, like you've said, owning a, owning a sports team is very profitable. Not necessarily how they show the books in their bottom line every year, but if you go to sell that franchise you bought for 200 mil in 93 
and you can sell it for two and a half billion now. Guess what? You just made a couple couple doll hairs there. And I hope with how much money is in the world and everything, we get a couple of those owners out, you know, flip that house, sell it, and bring me the Cuban, Mark Cuban types. Give I think me the we're going to see that. Give me the guys who want to compete. And, I mean, the Miami Marlins, think about our mindset from the start since they became a team. It's like, oh, well, Miami, you know, they're prospects. They bring them up, and they had a couple winning years, and then they, they trade them before they get there. And, you know, Miami, they never pay for players. They had that one year when they wanted to get the new stadium and show the fans that they were going for it that they got a bunch of free agents, and then they traded them away. If, a, if Mark Cuban bought the Miami Marlins tomorrow, they could be one of the highest payroll teams, and they probably would be. And, man, I, fan bases are going to start clamoring for their Uncle Steve. Imagine being the rich guy. Imagine being Cincinnati's famous billionaire. Uh, imagine being the Pittsburgh billionaire and the Pirates are for sale. And you can become what Steve Cohen is becoming? Yeah, man. And, I mean, give me it. Give me all of it. I don't know what's going on with my microphone. <laughs> I got some oh light coming God. in here. It's on fire because we're talking <laughs> hot ball right now. Listen, I think credit to Steve, 100%. But you can also say, look, it's New York, of course. Like, that's that's what New York's uh, – the owner of a New York franchise is supposed to do. I think the Padres doing what they're doing is almost, like, more shocking to the baseball world than than what Steve Cohen is doing. I, I know what the payroll is, and it's obviously very shocking and, and awesome to see him. But the fact that the Padres can go out and spend money like this, that has to open up everybody's eyes. And, and, and you have to look at your franchise and say, well, they're doing it. What's going on here? Why are we balking at an extra... $10 million over 10 years. Like why, why are we missing out on these free agents over nominal amounts of money relatively? It, it, you, you have to ask these questions of these different franchises. My own Minnesota twins. I love you guys, mm. but you could have had Carlos Correa. If you just stepped it up a little bit. Right. We saw that. We saw that. He went from 13, 345 to 12, whatever this one is. Twins could have got there. Yeah. I think they were close, but like sometimes you just got to spend a little bit more. You got to get out of your comfort zone. And boy, oh boy, Uncle Steve is making these owners uncomfortable. When Aaron Judge signed, one of the things I said to Yankees fans, which nobody was actually mad, but it's the internet. But, you know, when, when his, uh, what was it? Nine for 360? Is that his final number? Uh, judge, yeah. Yeah. Nine for 360. I was like, well, if you were comfortable with the 302 or 300 that had been rumored, you're talking over nine years. You're, it's like six and a half million per year. Like, you're, you're really going to worry about your team's payroll that intent, intensely, especially Yankee fans, which no one cares. 